Hello again. Um, just wanted to remind you that uh, you need to keep up with your work, keep up with your due dates, make sure you do your study guide, make sure you ask good questions. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to email. Um, but today we're going to go ahead and work on, um, on uh, flowering plant structure. So that'll be our topic for today. Um, so I want to talk about the external anatomy of a plant to begin with. And you can see here just a kind of a general plant. Uh, you're familiar with the concept of uh, leaves. Let me go back. You're familiar with the concept of uh, leaves, roots, and stems. But uh, if you're not, let me go ahead and remind you that plants all have, at least the plants we're talking about now, the vascular plants have leaves. They have, uh, of course, roots and uh, they have a, a stem. Okay, so these are three major organs that we're going to talk about today and how they're arranged. So if we just kind of look at a few things here, so here's a leaf and you have in between right there at the armpit of the of the little um, stem coming into the uh, main stem, the stem of the leaf coming into the main stem, you have this little thing called a node. So this is where a little bud sits that if I take and rip that leaf off, that little bud will grow into a new leaf and replace the leaf. So we have the apex of the of the of the plant. We have the root apex down here at the bottom. Uh, you can see that there is an internode. So the distance between two nodes is called an internode. That's denoted right over here. Inside of the stem, there will be the vascular tissue, the xylem and the phloem, that's going to be conducting uh, uh, nutrients, minerals, and water. And if we look down here at the roots, we're going to see that there are lateral roots, and then there's a main tap root oftentimes. The, there are different kinds of roots. Uh, some some uh, vascular plants don't have tap roots. They just have, um, they just have lots of fibrous roots that come out of the, uh, of the stem. And then there are little itty bitty hairs. So you can see little root hairs here and here. This is a little collection of root hairs. So sometimes coming off the lateral root, there will be root hairs. Sometimes coming off the main tap root, there will be little root hairs. And the little root hairs job is to increase the surface area to increase the ability to absorb uh, water and nutrients from the soil. So we'll talk about the major types of tissues and the root stems and leaves. And we'll start with the uh, with the um, with the concept that uh, every every uh, the the roots, leaves, and stems are the main organs of the plant. So they're going to be made up of various kinds of tissues. And there are three main kinds of tissues. There's dermal tissue. This is kind of like a covering tissue. There is vascular tissue. This is a conducting tissue. And then filling in the spaces is kind of like a ground tissue. So we'll talk about each of those. Let's go ahead and start with dermal tissue. So dermal tissue is going to make up the plant's outer covering. And uh, you can see a little graphic down here of uh, dermal tissue. And uh, in this particular graphic, there is a, a single row of cells making up the dermal tissue. And uh, these cells are, are, are very specialized uh, to protect the outer covering of, of fruits and stems and leaves. and uh, they have a cuticle. This is a waxy layer that uh, it, it does the same job as if you put chapstick on your lips. If your lips are drying out or getting chapped, you put wax on it and that helps to uh, protect it and, and not allow drying to occur. Sometimes uh, plants will have trichomes. These are little hair-like extensions that come out of the cells. Sometimes these trichomes are very irritating. If you've ever walked in the woods and, and uh, walked into a patch of uh, stinging nettle, they have trichomes that actually inject serotonin into you, which is a very irritating chemical. Um, and uh, it's uh, some, some people it causes a rash, other people it just causes pain and itching. So uh, there are sometimes spaces uh, like uh, stomata, which are little holes or little pores that form in the, that outer covering. And, uh, and this tissue is not really thick, so it allows sunlight through to get to, um, to layers of cells that are going to undergo photosynthesis. So this is a highly specialized tissue. It's a protective covering around the, um, the root stems and leaves. 
Vascular tissue carries out the transport of substances throughout the, uh, the body of the plant. We have the xylem, which is going to be carrying uh, water and dissolved minerals. And uh, if you notice the graphic below, the xylem typically carries uh, water from the from the roots to the stem and leaves. So we have a one-way uh, one transport that occurs. So uh, there's no uh, so in between the cells making up these these uh, these vessels, there's no um, wall cell walls blocking or preventing the flow of water. Uh, we do have lignified or or thickened uh, cells along the edges of those uh, of those conducting vessels. Lignin makes it very strong so they don't collapse in on themselves. Most of the time at maturity these cells are actually dead. So one-way path um, and it's carrying water and minerals. The phloem on the other hand transports sugar where it's from where it's made typically at the leaves or the stem to where it's needed and stored. So you can you can take and send it uh, to where it's needed, uh, so for active cell division or perhaps where it's stored if you have excess amounts of nutrients. It can be stored in the roots and sometimes there are modified stems that can store phloem as well. Phloem will also go to where you're producing seeds and fruit so you can take sugar that's made from photosynthesis to those places where it's needed to build fruit. Uh, if you take a look down here at this graphic, notice that phloem has a, a two-way path. So we don't have just a one-way path, but uh, water and minerals, and excuse me, the nutrients and, and water uh, can flow in both directions. We do have little, in between each of the cells, there are little plates. If you were to look at these plates from the top view, there will be little holes all over those plates that the substances can actually go through. Okay, those are not seen in the xylem. So our next tissue is ground tissue. This is tissue that's neither dermal uh, nor vascular, so it's not an outer covering and it's not conducting water and nutrients. And uh, it carries out various functions such as storage of uh, excess uh, nutrients, uh, photosynthesis is, uh, occurs by ground tissue, and it also supports the plant, giving it strong strength. And uh, there are three types of tissues that are ground tissues. We have parenchyma tissue, we have calenchyma tissue and sclerenchyma tissue. So we'll talk about the cells that make up each of those types of tissue. So just as your organs are made of tissue, plants' organs are made of tissue as well, and parenchyma, calenchyma, and sclerenchyma are the tissues that make up the plant bodies. They each have different jobs that they perform. So just like any organism, plant cells have cell differentiation and specialization. So, you know, plants don't have muscle tissue, but they do have specialized cells that, are, that, that uh, serve a function. Um, and they can be highly specialized and they can differentiate from, from uh, common tissues or common cells into very specialized cells. The common cell types include parenchyma cells. These are typical what we would call typical plant cells and it's the least specialized of the of the uh, of the types of cells. Um, parenchyma cells uh, make up so photosynthetic cells and they're making up storage cells and I have an example of a parenchyma cell down here and you can see inside this parenchyma cell there are little chloroplasts that are going to undergo photosynthesis. Um, these parenchyma cells can be found in tissues of leaves, fruit, and storage organs and storage roots. The next type of cell would be calenchyma cells. These are very elongated cells and uh, if you've ever taken and eaten celery before there's a picture of celery you know you can actually pull celery into little strands. Those little strands are, are calenchyma cells. Okay so that just gives you an idea of, of what they look like. They provide flexible support for the plant so if you've ever flexed a piece of celery before, it doesn't crack necessarily. It does crack it at some point in time, but it does have some flexibility to it because of the calenchyma strands that are in there. So these are just some what calenchyma cells look like over here in case you wanted to see what they look like. This would be more from a top view and this would be more from a side view. So they're kind of elongated um, unless you're looking at them from the top. Sclerenchyma cells uh, are another type of cell, and they're going to function in rigid support of the plant structure. They're composed of lignin, so it's a very strong material, uh, support material, and these cells are oftentimes dead at functional maturity. 
and uh, their shape will depend on their function. So, um, so you can see some of them are more fibrous and like, and some are others of them are more jagged like. So they do uh, provide great strength. If you've ever felt like an acorn or um, or the outer husk of uh, say a walnut or a, a pecan, they're gonna. If you look at that material under the microscope, they're gonna have these sclerids in there that are going to be jagged and form a great support and structure. And this is just showing you like a tomato plant. I have one growing on my uh, on my deck right now, and uh, so so just to show you that that plant is made of tissues, and those tissues make up organs. So we can see here that uh, if you take a cut through the stem and uh, look at it uh, under a microscope, you'll see xylem and phloem, and uh, that would be the vascular tissue. You can see ground tissue in the, this little space between here and here. And then we have an outer covering, which is going to be the dermal tissue. So we have dermal tissue, ground tissue, vascular tissue, making up this organ that we call the stem. Okay, so remember, just as you have organs that are made of cells, plants have organs that are made of, of, of tissues and cells as well. What I want to do now is talk about roots, stems, and leaves and, uh, and give you an idea of uh, some differences between them, what they look like under the microscope, and, uh, and just talk a little bit about modifications that they might have. So a root is an organ. It's just an organ like any other organ that you might have in your body. And its specialized job is to anchor the plant. And uh, it absorbs, it absorbs uh, minerals and water. And uh, this anchors it to the soil, which is where the minerals and water are going to be. Oftentimes, a, a, a root can store carbohydrates. And you can see over here a eudicot root versus a monocot root. Remember, these are two major types of angiosperms like we learned in the last uh, lecture. So if you look at a eudicot root, it's very different than a monocot root. Do you see the differences? So if you look at a tap root, which is what a eudicot has, it has a long, uh, a long root with uh, various lateral roots that come off, but there's one main central root that uh, makes up the plant with multiple lateral roots that come out. So in uh, a monocot, it actually has fibrous roots. So it has, uh, it has a common attachment point here and then it has many fibrous roots that come out. No main tap root is seen. And uh, so w which one do you think would make a better plant to control erosion? You probably would agree with me that the monocot roots, such as this grass right up here, would be better at holding soil. So if you want to protect uh, from soil erosion, you would plant monocots. And typically most of you will plant monocots in your, in your yard to, uh, to control erosion from occurring. Now, if you notice, all of these roots increase the surface area of the plant so that uh, it is better at absorbing minerals and water. And most of these roots are going to have mycorrhizae, which are the fungal, um, the mutualistic fungal relationships where the fungi cover the surface of that and increase the uh, surface area even more to absorb water and minerals. Just showing you a root over here. And uh, you can see an emerging lateral root. Here's a little lateral root coming off the main uh, tap root in this example. So um, it does have a covering on the outside surface that we've talked about. Here's a bunch of root hairs covering the whole root at the cap, at the near the near the root cap, is this mucus-like material called mucigel, and uh, it's a sheath that helps the root push through the soil and uh, slide on through the soil. So here's the root cap. And this is a protective layer as it's pushing through the soil, it protects the root. If we kind of look at a cross section uh, or actually a longitudinal section through the middle of a root, it gives you an idea of, uh, of what it might look like. So for example, if you were to cut the root and look at it under the microscope, this is what this particular section would look like. And then if you cut, the, um, if you cut this root part down here, this is what it looks like over here. There are different areas of the root. You can see there's root hairs up here, but, but when you look at it under the microscope, there is an area, an active area of cell division that's uh, just above the root cap. This active area of cell division looks like this. And uh, if I take and zoom in just here for one second, just to refresh your memory, in Biology 101, you looked at the different stages of cell division. 
So in the area of division, you can see things like uh, like uh, prophase. Well, I can't use my, my apologies, I can't use my styles here. But you can see various stages like prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase because these cells are actively going through cell division. So I can see a prophase here. I can see uh, you, perhaps a metaphase there. Here's an anaphase or, or late, uh, late anaphase. Here's a telophase. And uh, so you can see the, the stages of cell division. As those cells migrate up, so as they migrate from the area of cell division, they're pushed upwards to the area of elongation. And these are where the cells will fill with water. Their cell walls will uh, elongate and grow so they can grow longer. And then eventually they'll differentiate into specialized cells that will do different jobs for the root. Okay, so we have a little migration of cells as they go through these different areas. They go through division, elongation, and then eventually specialization or differentiation. And this is just showing you another histological or microscopic slide of that. You can see the root cap. There are apical meristems of the root. This is what allows the root to grow in length. Um, there is also a tissue here that is going to allow the root to grow in girth. Okay, so there are meristems there that uh, are going to allow it to grow in girth, and it has an epidermis on the outer edge. So this is what a dicot and monocot root look like in difference. So if you notice the xylem and phloem are in the center of a dicot root, and the xylem makes an X. That's kind of convenient since it's an X in the word xylem. There then is an outer covering around the vascular tissue called a pericycle. There is an endodermis that covers the pericycle. There's a cortex layer, kind of an outer layer, and of course there's an epidermis on the outer surface. If you notice the um, monocot root over here, the monocot root has uh, the xylem and phloem in a circle kind of towards the center. The phloem's on the outer edge and the xylem's kind of on the inner, and then there is a pith. This would be made of uh, a various uh, ground tissue that makes a central portion. It does have a pericycle, an endodermis, a covering around the pericycle, and uh, it has a cortex of ground tissue, and then of course we have the epidermis around the outer edge. If you take a, a, a dicot root, so if I take a dicot root and I take a cross section of it, so a little section of it, and then look at it from the top view, this is what I look at, at under the microscope. And you can see that the vascular cylinder is, there's the X that marks the spot and the phloem is in between that. So the xylem is the X and the phloem is in between in these blue areas here and here. We then have the ground uh, tissue and we have an epidermis. So X marks the spot for the dicot root. So follow your study guide. You're definitely required to know that material. This is just showing a more blown up view of the phloem and uh, the xylem that's in the middle. And that's a dicot root. So here's a monocot root. And uh, you notice that the phloem is going to be in a circle around the uh, xylem, which is on the interior around here. So it's more of a circle situation and uh, not an X. So it has all the regular parts, the cortex, the epidermis, just in common with the dicot root. So how do uh, roots absorb water and minerals? Well, there's a couple of ways that water can flow into the root. So if we take a look down here at this diagram, this will show you that there is a symplastic route and there's an apoplastic route. The symplastic route essentially brings water and the water goes through these little, uh, these little plasmodesmata, these little channels in between the cells, and it goes all the way into eventually reaching the xylem. So that's called the, the symplastic route. Again, we move through these little plasmodesmata and eventually get to the xylem in the middle. Apoplastic goes in between cells. Okay, so you can see this red line is taking it in between cells to a point. At some point, though, there, the, the water is going to have to go through the cell. So if I look at this graphic up here, I can see uh, the apoplastic route. Um, there are these little... Um, waxy strips called Casparian strips that uh, wrap around the cell 
um, once you get to what we call the endodermis. And because those waxy layers wrap around the whole cell, then the water is going to have to enter in. It can't go in between the cells because the Casparian stroke prevents it to do, doing that. So it eventually will have to go through the cells and, uh, and then eventually get into the xylem. So that Casparian strip does prevent apoplastic flow, eventually making it go through the cell and then eventually to the xylem. And minerals are, are absorbed in the same kind of way uh, in addition to the water. This is just showing you a, a root uh, of, a, of a, a, a carrot, and uh, it's showing you this little area right here called the vascular cambium. This is the area that will produce um, uh, secondary growth. So phloem is going to be made this way. Xylem is going to be made this way. This is the tissue that has the cells that divide to make it. So that's a little bit about the primary xylem and secondary xylem and primary phloem and secondary phloem. So um, the plant will continue to grow in this kind of fashion if it has secondary growth. So you can almost add rings to it uh, after a period of time. So roots uh, do serve many different purposes. One of the purposes is for food storage for the plant. So we have carrots and sweet potatoes and radishes and turnips and beets and parsnip. These are all examples of roots that are storing um, materials. Um, this is just kind of an odd root here. This is a ward, uh, water storage root. So that's another example of a, of a type of, of a function of root. Here's what the plant looks like on the surface. It kind of looks like a vine. But that vine, you can see this lady holding the vine, spreading out, and then she dug a hole here. And uh, this is called a man root. And uh, man root is uh, known to live in areas that uh, may be dry. And it uh, is a water storage uh, organ. There are also roots that have a different purpose. Adventitious roots help to anchor uh, a, uh, a root that uh, may uh, grow up uh, the side of a tree. In this example, you can see the stem of the root with these adventitious roots coming off. And this happens to be uh, poison ivy. So this is a, a leaflet here. Leaflets three, let it be, is the little mnemonic you use. So if you're in the woods and you see that, you don't want to touch it. There is an oil called urishol that um, will, uh, will actually go off of the leaf and into your skin and cause you to have uh, an allergic reaction to it if you're susceptible to that. Some people don't get um, the allergic reaction. So these little adventitious roots, they come off and they help anchor this, the little stem there of the vine to, to the main uh, plant. Another type of, of uh, root would be an aerial root. And in this example right here, a banyan tree, it has roots that come down from the stems and it anchors the plant and helps it to um, be able to grow in girth. Or as it grows in girth, it helps to anchor it to the ground so it doesn't fall over. There are also prop roots. These are roots that grow out of the stems. This happens to be a corn plant up here. It gives uh, great support to the plant and high wind. Okay, I don't know if you've ever seen corn plants before, but you wonder how in the world they stand so tall, and uh, it's the prop roots that are aiding them in that particular function. In a mangrove swamp, what you would see if you went down to the Florida Keys, you'd find these mangrove swamps, and there are plants that uh, have these, uh, these prop roots that come out, and they anchor the plant and help them to live in an aquatic environment so they don't fall over. There are also buttress roots. If you go to the tropical rainforest, uh, you'll sometimes see uh, buttress roots. Or if you go to some swamps, you might see plants with buttress roots. And uh, what these buttress roots do is they help to, um, to anchor the plant and uh, allow it to grow tall but not fall over. And you can see the guy over here in this uh, buttress root. So they get really tall and, and, and really large. Uh, one of the most dangerous places I've ever been is a mangrove swamp. Uh, I have taken and walked through a mangrove swamp before at low tide. You can see it's covered with algae. It's very dangerous. You can slip and fall and impale yourself on these, on these uh, pneumatophores. These are little breathing roots, and uh, they help the plants to live in water. And when high tide comes, it covers over most of the plant, but it doesn't co cover over all the plant. So as you can see, you know, high tide line, you can see with that little layer of slime there, the little, it looks like a little biofilm of slime. Um, there is some parts of the plant that remain above 
and can produce and provide oxygen for the plant um, at uh, high tide. Some people even call those root snorkels. And uh, in Virginia, we do have cypress swamps. And uh, if you go to a cypress swamp, the uh, the tree is here's the tree right here, the cypress tree, and uh, at bald cypress. And uh, these are the little uh, what they call cypress knees. And uh, so we used to think that these things were little root snorkels, but now we actually think that they stabilize the trees and help to anchor them. Um, and and uh, if you cut all the knees down, the, the tree still has enough oxygen to live. So we, again, think that these little things are helping to anchor the plant. Um, they're really cool. A long time ago, decoy carvers, people that used to hunt ducks for the market, uh, for the meat market to send food to the cities, they used to make duck decoys. Some of them made duck decoys out of the, these cypress knees. So they're actually a pretty decent carving wood. You carve them while their knees are fresh. There's also strangler roots, and uh, this is a strangler fig right here that's, that uh, you can see is growing up this uh, tree. It will parasitize the tree. Eventually, it will take and choke off. If you notice, the, the, the vine is choking off the tree, and eventually the tree will die. And the strangler fig will use the carcass of the tree to, to basically grow around and to, and, to, and to anchor it so it can grow taller and reach the tops uh, where the sunlight is. So that's a strangler fig, and those are strangler roots. There's also hostorial roots. These are roots of, uh, of some parasitic plants, and they grow into the host. Notice in this graphic here that the, 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 the parasitic plant here, here's the stem of it, it's actually growing into the plant and sucking and deriving nutrients from the plant, parasitizing the plant. You can see it really well here as well. And there's also nodular, nodular roots. These are um, what you would see in legumes. This is where you have bacteria uh, growing inside of those little nodules. Those are little mutualistic bacteria growing inside those nodules. And uh, these uh, are going to produce nitrogen and uh, for the plant. The plant provides sugar and, uh, and water for the bacteria and oxygen for the bacteria as well. A lot of times these root nodules will be red. Uh, because they have a, a hemoglobin-like pigment that, uh, that provides oxygen for these bacteria that need oxygen. Okay, so we'll now move on and talk about stems for just a second. So a stem has a job too. It's uh, a plant organ that raises or separates leaves, exposing uh, the leaves to sunlight. Um, a stem raises a flower up off the ground so that pollinators can see it. And those uh, flower parts are reproductive parts. These structures also allow the plant to grow upward to compete for sunlight. And uh, probably the reason why you see forests with trees that are so tall is because of the competition for sunlight. They're each competing with each other because you don't really want to get shaded out uh, because you won't get as much sunlight. This just shows you a, a stem. I, I would really encourage you to go out and look uh, at a stem. Uh, you'll see all kinds of leaves on it at this point in time uh, during the time period where I've uh, recorded this lecture. But in the winter time, you know, there won't be any leaves on there and you can see all these different structures. But I do encourage you go find a stick in the yard and, uh, and take a look at it. Um, one thing that's cool about looking at um, at, uh, at branches is that you can see how old they are. So, for example, this is one year's growth from this bud scar all the way uh, to the top would be one year's growth. From this bud scar to this bud scar is going to be last year's growth. So that's two years worth of growth that you can see. And then this is another year's growth from this bud scar right here to the next bud scar. This is what is going to represent the growth. Um, you can see leaf scars where leaves uh, used to exist. Um, so that's where the leaf actually branched out and formed a little stem. So this will leave a leaf scar eventually up here. Here's a little leaf scar right here. Uh, you can see axillary buds where, where growth is going to come out uh, if you break the branch off. Okay, so it is kind of cool to look at, uh, at the various uh, parts of the, of the, of the, um, the leaf. 
And uh, I encourage you to go out and look at that. So see if you can find a bud scar and a leaf scar and see if you can determine how old the, uh, the, the, the branch is that you're looking at. So this is a dicot stem. Uh, just as we looked at dicot roots and monocot roots, you should be familiar with what a dicot stem looks like. Um, it does have an epidermis. It uh, does have an inner pith. This is typically made of dead cells that uh, may just be supporting, they're lignified and supporting the, the, the upright structure. Um, so this is the vascular bundle. You have vascular cambium here. You have xylem over on this side, phloem over on this side. So, um, and then you have a cortex in between the epidermis and the vascular bundle. Remember that the vascular cambium that's right here is meristematic tissue. It's tissue that can undergo cell division. And uh, if I just drew out, there's the tissue there. If it grows this way, it produces xylem, excuse me, phloem. If it goes this way, it produces the xylem. So the growth this way produces new xylem. Growth this way produces new phloem. And that's why you can look at some stems and see the, uh, um, you can see the uh, age of it. Not the age, yeah, you can see the age of it. So here's a eudicot stem, just showing you more of a graphic form of this. So here's the epidermis, here's the cortex. Here you have your vascular bundles here and here. So this would be xylem, this would be phloem, and again, the, the, the in-between part is the vascular cambium that's producing the growth. If it grows this way, it's xylem. If it grows this way, it's phloem. And you can have growth for many years um, if the plant lives that long. And you can count the rings of xylem to see how old it is. So this is the pith, the inner dead material that is gives strength to the plant. This graphic here shows you um, uh, the growth. So you can see the primary phloem from the previous year's growth. Here's the secondary phloem, so you can actually see bands of that. Here is the primary xylem that was first formed, and then year two, the secondary xylem forms. So you can get layer after layer of that, uh, and you can actually see that. Remember, the vascular cambium is the tissue, the meristematic tissue that's going to undergo cell division in this area to produce that. So monocots have a little different arrangement of their stems. The vascular bundles are kind of randomly spread throughout um, the ground tissue. So you can see it here, here, and here, and here, and here are the various um, vascular bundles. Here's the epidermis. So know the differences between monocot stems and dicot stems. They have a very different arrangement to them. A couple of things about stems that are kind of interesting. If you ever look uh, and go look at this, uh, the trunk of a tree, um, you'll actually see these little, these little holes. And these are called lenticels. And this is what the tree breathes from. A lot of people don't understand this, but uh, plants do undergo photosynthesis, but they do also have mitochondria that require oxygen so that they can use their sugars in order to make ATP from, um, from those sugars. So those lenticels allow oxygen to come into the tree so it can actually, I guess in quotation marks, breathe and uh, provide oxygen for the mitochondria. Fruit also have them as well. If you ever take a look at, a, uh, at an orange, you'll see lenticels all over the surface of it. Apples have them as well. So fruit until you eat them are living and then they are going to be dead after you, um, after you take and, uh, and eat them. So this is a tree trunk or a tree cookie. We describe them as tree cookies because you can cut them and they kind of look like cookies. And if you look at it uh, from the top view, you can see the various growth lines. Okay, so where you see the more dense wood, that's the later growth um, in the in the late summer. Uh, but early spring, early summer, it has the uh, the thinner strip there. So you can actually count the rings of trees and uh, and and determine the age of the trees. So there is bark. There's an inner bark and an outer bark. Uh, do you know the purpose of bark? So bark is, uh, you know, there to, you know, if anything attaches to it, fungi or algae, the bark will actually shed so it can shed parasites from uh, growing on it. So here's the phloem right here. Phloem is going to be on the outer edge. 
And uh, if you ever see beaver uh, eat trees, they'll eat this outer edge of a tree, thus killing the tree. But they're eating that nice, delicious phloem, and uh, they really enjoy that. Unfortunately, if they take and ring a tree, go around all the way around, it destroys all the phloem, so the tree dies because nutrients can't get from the places that the sugar is being made to the places where it needs to, uh, to actually be. And then you can see there's all kinds of lateral rays. They call them rays in here. And this is just where water can be transported through these materials and sugar can be transported through them as well. Dendrochronology is kind of an interesting science. It's uh, basically using tree rings to date things. And uh, there's a great scientific method to that. We have thousands and thousands of years worth of tree rings in museums where we can understand what the weather was like uh, thousands of years ago. So um, looking at this particular specimen down here, you can see, you know, the first year's growth. You can see, you know, rainy season where you have really thick bands and then really dry seasons where you have thin bands. You can see scars from where there might have been forest fires. And if you look at uh, a plant like Methuselah we talked about before, you might have 4,000 years worth of data showing you wet years and, uh, and dry years. So you can look and see when droughts occurred, and uh, so that's kind of cool, and, and that's uh, dendro dendrochronology. Um, dendro is the root word for tree, and chrono is the root word for time, and of course logi is the root word for study of. These are a few modified stems. A rhizome is a modified stem. It's a stem that grows horizontally uh, versus uh, vertically, and uh, you can see roots come out of it, and you can grow various leaves out of it. Uh, a tuber is a modified stem to store nutrients, so that's a potato. An example would be a potato. We have bulbs and corms. Uh, you may be somewhat familiar with this, like an onion. And stolons are reproductive structures. These are stems that basically grow out. They produce roots, and if these things break off, they can produce brand new plants. So kind of a form of uh, asexual reproduction. Thorns are modified stems. Okay, I don't know if you ever thought about what a thorn was, um, but uh, a thorn is a modified stem. A spine, on the other hand, is a modified leaf. So if you see this right here, this thing right here, it has an axillary bud coming off. So that's actually a modified leaf because that axillary bud that's, that's right here shows us that this is a modified leaf. Here, this is just coming out of the stem, therefore it's a thorn and it's a modified stem structure. And I'm sure you've run into thorns before, and, uh, and if you've ever run into greenbrier around here. But we have several plants like Devil's Walking Stick that um, is a tree that grows around here that has thorns that come off the surface. And it hurts when you run into one of those things. A few more uh, modifications. We have, um, we have stem succulents. This is where you have fleshy stems, like here in the glasswort and, and, uh, and here over here in these uh, various cacti. These are, uh, are succulents. They store water. Aloe vera is another one that stores water as well. Um, this is just a, another um, cacti here. But you see a lot of these in dry areas. And the, the reason they're succulent is to store water in between the rainy seasons. And this takes us to, to finally the leaves, uh, the last major organ that we're going to talk about. So the leaf is, uh, is the major photosynthetic organ of a plant. Um, there are some plants that have stems that have uh, chloroplasts and, and cells that have chloroplasts in them. But uh, you notice here the difference between a eudicot leaf and, uh, and a monocot leaf. So here we have... Um, uh, you know, a leaf coming off and it's going to have netted venation, so netted venation coming off here. These are going to be parallel veins that are going to come off. Here you have a petiole. This is just a clasping leaf that's clasping off the surface of the um, stem. You're responsible for knowing the parts of a leaf. I'm going to take uh, in this next uh, a slide after I show you a, a microscope slide of it and a drawing of it, I'll show you how that should be uh, drawn for testing purposes. This is a very complex organ though. It's, it's an organ just like your liver is an organ. So it has a cuticle, an outer, outer, outer waxy layer. We have an upper epidermis and a lower epidermis that actually makes the whole, um, the, the leaf actually an organ that's protected by two layers. 
There is a palisade parenchyma uh, or um, a palisade mesophyll. There's a spongy mesophyll, and I'll draw these for you in just a second. The palisade mesophyll's job is to undergo photosynthesis. The spongy mesophyll's job is to undergo photosynthesis and to provide little air spaces. You can see little air spaces in between them, and this is where gases get trapped, like carbon dioxide and oxygen. It also has a vein that comes through that has uh, the xylem and phloem, so you can bring nutrients, uh, take nutrients out and bring water and minerals in. The lower epidermis has little um, little stomata, and uh, these allow gases to to come in and gases to go out, and also water to go out so that you can uh, have evaporative cooling. You know, it gets really hot when you're exposed to the sun all day, so you do want evaporative cooling, and those little stomata allow that to uh, to occur. This is showing you a, uh, a picture of it, uh, taking a photograph of it from a microscope. You can see the upper epidermis, lower epidermis, the palisade mesophyll, the spongy mesophyll. Uh, we can see over here xylem, so a little, a little vein that's going through. And uh, here's a little trichome, a little hair coming off. And uh, we also have the stoma, which is the little hole that allows gases to travel in and out, and also water to travel out. So if, if I were going to draw it for testing purposes, this is the way I would do it. I, I guess I would draw an upper epidermis. And uh, I would make sure I have a cuticle on the outside surface. So we have the cuticle. And we have, which is this structure here, we have the upper epidermis. We then have the palisade mesophyll or palisade, palisade parenchyma. And there's going to be chloroplast inside of that that are going to undergo photosynthesis. So palisade, mesophyll. Uh, and I'm going to draw a little vein right here. There's a little vein going through. And you have xylem and you have phloem. This is going to be the spongy mesophyll. So spongy mesophyll is going to just kind of be uh, uh, cells, parenchyma cells, that are going to allow little spaces for gases to collect in. So this layer is the spongy mesophyll. And then at the very bottom... We have the lower epidermis, and these are guard cells. And they form a little hole called a stoma. And that allows gases to enter and exit the uh, plant so that you can let water out for evaporative cooling, just like plant sweat. It's called transpiration. And you can allow gases like ox uh, like carbon dioxide in. And gases like oxygen can also leave too. You don't want gases to build up inside the leaf and blow it up. So that's a simple drawing. Maybe you can do something like that for your study guide. And uh, definitely work on those study guides. So here's a eudicot leaf. I kind of think that's cool because you can see the netted venation. And you can really see it here. Which is kind of cool and then you can see it blown up here I just think uh, those are incredible now you have all these branching points to increase the surface area of cells you know leaves are not chunky they're flat they're flat to increase the surface area that Sun can strike this is a monocot leaf you can see parallel venation not netted venation and if you look at it in cross-section so if you took a cross-section and looked at that under the microscope you're going to see round circles that are evenly distanced apart from one another, and that represents uh, netted venation. So each of these is a little vein that's going through it. And the reason it looks like that is because you're cutting it in cross-section and looking at it from a side view. Again, this is just showing you a, uh, a monocot. Corn is a monocot. And if you cut it in cross section, you can see the the various um, the various uh, veins there. You can see a little trachome there, upper epidermis, lower epidermis, a little stoma, a little hole that it can bring air into and out, and uh, and release water. So modifications of leaves include tendrils. 
Tendril is a, a modified leaf that uh, holds on to a stem as a vine is climbing. So, for example, this particular vine, if it's climbing, it can shoot those tendrils over and hold on to another plant beside it and grow taller and taller. Why do you think they're coiled? Why do you think these little tendrils are coiled? So, yeah, so, so if you were to knock into this plant, it won't rip the, the garden pea off of the, the plant that it's climbing on because this little, this little coil here can stretch out and then spring back. So it's kind of a cool little modification. So here we have modified leaves into spines. So that's what you would see in uh, cacti. These are modified leaves. How do we know they're a modified leaf? Because they have that little axillary bud there. Okay. Uh, I would assume that you understand that spines are for protection from herbivores eating uh, the plant. Here are some leaf succulents. So we have aloe and uh, things like living stones and uh, other kinds of plants you would see at Lowe's or at Walmart that you can buy and put in your house. So these are storing water. Uh, another modified leaf would be a bract. So if you've ever seen a dogwood flower, those are actually the things I'm circling there or outlining there, uh, the white structures are actually bracts. Okay, they're modified leaves. The, the flowers, if you notice over here, I enlarged the flower so you could see it. But the flowers are actually yellow. The bracts are white. And, uh, and so those aren't actually flowers. So you, if you enjoy dogwood flowers, you'd have to actually get in and look at them. Uh, you may be enjoying the bracts. Ah, one of my favorite plants is the Venus flytrap. I can't find a place to put my face, so I'll just put it there. But the Venus flytrap uh, has a, a, a really complex uh, modified leaf um, that's uh, organized uh, to, um, to catch insects. So Venus flytraps will typically live in areas that other plants can't live in. Typically, they're boggy areas. We don't have them in Virginia, but we do have them in North Carolina that live naturally. And uh, if you notice on the inside of the leaf, there are these little these little hairs. They're called trigger hairs. And an insect has to crawl across these things and touch them. And if they, it, uh, the, the Venus flytrap can actually count. It actually have to have to touch more than one hair. And uh, so if it touches more than one hair, the plant can count it. And uh, it will cause, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, the trap to collapse. Basically, it causes dehydration of the leaf, and the leaf will snap shut. You can see up here, bad day for the grasshopper. So that leaf will eventually close completely, and digestive juices will leak into, into the, um, the plant uh, trap and uh, digest the insect. Now, these, these plants aren't eating meat necessarily, but they're digesting the insect to get the nitrogen so it can build from photosynthesis. You know, it can build sugars, and from these sugars and from the nitrogen, it can build amino acids and uh, nucleic acids or, you know, components of DNA. So that's an awesome plant. This is a sundew. We have these up in, uh, I've seen them up in West Virginia, and sundews have little sticky, uh, little sticky components to them. Notice they look kind of like flesh, so they look almost like dead flesh, and the bugs are attracted to it. They get stuck in the little the little juices there, and then the, the plant will actually fold and cover the insect up. And again, it dumps digestive juices. It can live in areas, again, that uh, other plants can't live in. So there's the sundew opened, and there's a bug trapped inside it, so the leaf just collapses around it. And then there's also the pitcher plant. We have these in Virginia. I've seen them in one location in Virginia, but they're mostly in North Carolina and South. And uh, you can see that it has an opening here. It's very waxy. It has a very waxy coating uh, all around there. And at the bottom, there's a pool of, uh, of water and digestive juices. So an insect comes in. It falls in. It can't climb back out because of that really slicky, waxy layer. Falls in the juices, and, uh, and it uh, gets... Uh, digested. Well, that completes a little bit of plant structure. We went through and talked about plant tissues. We talked about plant cells. We then talked about uh, the, uh, major, uh, the major organs of a plant, the leaf stems and roots. 
and, uh, and talked about some modifications of that. As usual, make sure that you are doing your um, as usual, make sure you're doing your study guides. Make sure you're taking um, your work seriously. You're keeping up with your work, keeping up with your activities, keeping up with your due dates. And if you have any problems, you need to make sure that you get with me. So with that, I'll say um, good day. And uh, I hope uh, your learning is, um, is going well.